So, uh, just out of interest, how many people here know about the Open Risk 2000 project? Mm. No, in which sense? Heard well, you heard sort of, of it. <laughs> uh, heard of it, know what we've been doing with it or anything. Yeah, right. Okay, so a handful of us know. So this started about two years ago uh, with a thought of, we need to think past Open Risk 1000. Open Risk 1000 was specified in 1999, it's time to think about what would a successor look like. And we got to some initial framework for that discussion. Um, the fact that what made this common was that it was on the basic philosophy of, of open riskness. But we weren't looking for backwards or forwards compatibility with open risk 1000. So it could be inspired by it, but it wouldn't particularly be the same architecture. A lot of the stuff that we moved into Orbsoc V3, the modularity, that was very much a, a design criterion. It must be suitable for multi-core use, which was something that Open Risk 1000 was conceived of, but never really crystallised into. Um, and when we had the discussion last year, we came to the conclusion that this is a processor aimed at the deeper end of embedded, the sort of place where the cortex processors play, where the bigger Arduinos play. Um, so that means code size is going to be important, that 16 to 32 bit data and instructions is going to be important, that 64 bit support is not important. Um, and the aim is to aim at the small and medium sized FPGAs. I think we all recognize that open risk strength is going to be primarily in the FPGA space, even though, as we've heard from David, as we know from ST and from NXP, people do then turn them into ASICs. Okay. Um, in doing the work, we've got a certain amount of progress. Uh, Julius did some very interesting work looking at the existing open risk instruction set and analysing what instructions were used so we knew where the, the, the core was. And we came out with a first attempt uh, at an instruction set, which I'm going to open in a new tab, um, which is a Google Doc, um, where we started to look at what sort of instructions we might want, um, what sort of size they might be, uh, and so forth. But I think it's fair to say, just I had a look at the history on this page. Nothing's been done for a year on this. The commercial notification, this was initially initiated by Orsop when I think they saw the potential for, some potent for a new architecture. That commercial potential hasn't really materialized for them, so not unreasonably. Help. I don't know what caused that. Some Simon. This is Simon's laptop. Um, so really the purpose of this discussion, and it might end up being a very short discussion this morning, is really to explore if we want to move OR2K forward at this stage, if someone wants to move forward. And I think it really needs someone to pick it up and run with it as their pet project. It might be something that a student wants to pick up. It might be something that some of us around here wants to pick up. So um, the floor is now open. Comments, suggestions, ideas. What do we want to do with OR2K? I have heard that we have people have requested both ends of the range. Uh, some people want something that's similar to R1K, but uh, with, with all the rough edges taken off. Someone wants something completely different, like some, I don't know, configurable uh, instruction sets and things like that. So, what I think is that we haven't come any far at all. We haven't done anything. So that, that's the reason for asking the question, is to see whether there is any pressure for any... I think the really interesting stuff this year has been Orpsoc V3, which I think has moved open risk from a really interesting hobby project to something that actually starts to look like, yes, it's open source, but you can use it seriously in commercial contexts. I think a lot of what we've heard today, which is showing, you know, whether it's um, uh, Keown talking about commercial aspirations of putting this up into you know, space applications, or David talking about 
you know, some pretty serious low power research based on this as a, as a, as a, as a core processor it says that's been a move forward. The question is, we had this aspiration a year or two ago for a new processor in the broad open risk design approach. I'm sort of feeling that maybe that's a project that sits there and we're not quite sure what we want to do with a new project as opposed to developing what we have today. Yes? I'm wondering if there are people really see the deficiencies in our 1,008 instruction sets or like if there's, I think the burden is not strong enough so nobody's willing to take up and I saw there's a lot of modifications in the architecture specification and if you can keep up with it and everything, it, it seems everybody's fine with it. So. Uh, I think you started M or uh, 1KX after uh, OpenOS 2000 started, so even your yeah. motivation was to still stick to the old instruction set. Yeah, and I think one problem is it's not defining an architecture and doing an implementation, that's like a small part of it. Then you have the whole infrastructure around it, that's going to be the like big project. So if to make the OpenRisk 2000 project successful, you have to kind of, it's not enough that it's one guy's pet project. You have to like know that people will jump on it and build the infrastructure with compilers and that kind of stuff around it. Because, I mean, there's a lot of open source processors, but their problem is that they don't have the infrastructure. That's kind of over risk. One of its strengths. I, I yeah. I mean, that's fair. I mean, if you look at the history, you know, open risk benefited from Flextronics essentially paying for a large number of people to work on this mm -hmm. for a few years in the early two thousands. Um, the two issues we put to, picked up on, which one is David Morel and it's come out elsewhere, is code size is dreadful compared yeah. to some more. So for deeply embedded applications. Open risk rather falls down on that. The multi-core, I think, is less of an issue because, as Stefan has told, shown, you can extend OR1K reasonably well to, to, and of course, you've done the same thing, David, to do multi-core. So, multi-core you can solve by extending OR1K. Code density, I think, Julius's work and the reason we went down the OR2K route was there is just not the space in the instruction set for OR1K to just extend it with short instructions. Um, it, wa it wasn't an option there. Um, so the code density issue, I think, was the big driver. The, 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 the CPU speed, maybe? Trying to increase the... Well, that, that's more the MO1KX, the cappuccino work. Yeah. Uh, you know, that's, that, that was an implementation issue. I don't think anyone's ever suggested there's a serious architectural hazard to performance of OR1K. Um, well, there's nothing stopping you building a super scalar out of order, you know, massively long pipeline, oh, well, okay, at all, you can do it. Architecturally, yeah, there's nothing stopping there. Yeah, I think the only, only thing that was kind of pipeline specific in the, in the architectural specification was in the base lot, and since we made that optional, it's kind of, it's pretty flexible what, what the implementation looked like. Do we know for sure that it's really a benefit to have to reduce the code, uh, to improve the code density and to, to reduce the code size? Um, yeah. Certainly. Because I mean, it will complexify a lot of things in the hardware. If, if you have like uh, variable length instructions, for instance, it's but that's not the point here. It would be still risk, but like with the arm with the thumb, just having two instructions. Just two nodes. Okay. Oh. Yeah, I mean, there's ARM, there's ARC. I mean, if you look at the people who play in that low power, deeply embedded space, they all go down. Yeah. They're 32 bit players, they all go down this uh, code Because code density matters, because you've got to light up more flash memory, oh, you've got to right. heat more ROM for RAM. So it's, it's a non starter in industry, basically. Oh, really? Because of code density. No one's going to touch it. Um, and so my idea is that you need industry to get involved, like ASIC industry to get involved with the development before you're going to see any major takeoff. Like, okay, it's nice that academia and hobbyists get involved, but there's no one here from a major, like, major company who's using this in commercial. No, and we that's haven't not, seen any that's not true. Ever. There's not a, a half a house, let's say, D30 really, that you pack two instructions into 
uh, one solid two bit uh, instruction code. So you don't have to have the variable code start and length, but um, you, you do get the extra instruction density. Sure, but I, yeah, there's many ways of solving this, but I think it, the question is, is code density enough of an issue to make the big change away from a one one k development to one one two k? Okay, it was a fairly brief discussion, but we wanted to break it. Oh, sorry, here. Yeah, why, uh, why the 64 bit support was discarded? Because, well, it's because for deeply embedded, we can't see that 64 bit is relevant to deeply embedded. And it was driven by, it's the deeply embedded guys that care about code density. If you're sort of, if you're in the sort of smartphone business, you've got 4 gig of RAM there, you know, code density is not such a big issue. But if you're making smart meters that have got to last for 15 years on a single, Battery, then you didn't worry about code density. So, okay. so, so what I saw with the vertebrate with ultra low power processors that its density for storage is, of course, one part, but mainly the power usage is really an instruction fetch. If you, for very uh, instructions that happen very often, and you fetch them uh, and you have big words for them, it, it costs all the power. Really so, uh, just for this, okay. for this reason, I think it would be very helpful to have. A flexible mode, not necessarily that you can switch it, right? But you can actually mix it. That you have most of the common instructions have maybe 16 bit or maybe even less, if it's possible, and then have others mixed with it. Which, like you said, might increase the hardware uh, complexity for a decode, but it's probably a worthwhile trade off. Mm -hmm. Simon, if you want to just check there, put the sandwiches somewhere sensible. So don't find it. Yeah. Yeah. Just, just to finish with the 64 bit, yeah. as you are working on. I mean, both 16, 32, wouldn't it be the occasion to make it variable and then 64? No, because then you have the complexity kicking in. You don't want to pay the price of a complex decoder. Depends for which application. I mean, yeah. That, that, that's a, a CPU. Uh, uh, if it's modular, you could have it as an opt-in feature. Yeah, I think yeah. I think the um, the answer is. But what's becoming clear is there isn't, as Julia said, there isn't the real drive. Yet, it's worth it. Yeah. So I think, yeah, yeah, yes. So I think, yeah, it's it's a great thing. I think it's really there where there's some thought there. There's some, some useful analysis from Julius. If someone wants to pick this up and then run with it, but I think the fact that it hasn't really worked for a year means it, it's part there as a a project for the future. But it really needs someone who really cares and has got enough resource to make all the bits happen. Oh, so um, it's a bit of a self-fulfilling prophecy because. Uh, so, to so want to run largest programs on low power with this low memory footprint, choose another processor. But, you know, sometimes people come along for other reasons, like NASA did, you know, with reasons for wanting an open risk solution. And that, that, that's Flextronics did, NASA did with, you know, remember TechEd sat, and NASA's development was driven by NASA's concern it only had one open risk option, which was Leon. Uh, open option, and it wanted a second one, which is why it backed open it. So I, I think it would be, I think one of the reasons why no one's done anything on it in the last year, and one of the reasons why it might be a bit silly to pursue it right now, is it will distract from the good work that's going on based on around OR1K, which isn't actually OR1K specific anymore. Things like Orpsoc could be used to build any open source, you know, RTL architecture. But um, yeah, it would be a little bit counterproductive to go off and then stick our heads in documents and Excel sheets for the next six months and hack away on the tool chains and really start from square one again and um, have nothing you know to play with and, and show off running you know Lucas Arts games and things like that okay. for another five years it would which is maybe how long it would take if it was just left up to people working on their okay. working on it on their okay. okay. It would be a killer application for like a more powerful open. Uh, would it be something like uh, artificial intelligence in space? I think it would be low power and, and competitive code density. Yeah, but for uh, for uh, going in, going in, sorry, for sixty-four bit. Oh, sixty. It, it it yeah. It may come with the Internet. Of, I mean, it may the pressure may come. You look at Internet of Things. You see the actual power of open source as it comes in through the Arduino, Raspberry Pi, and so forth on the software side into Internet of Things. Internet of Things relies on these high code density things, but it hasn't yet got to the maturity yet as an industry where it's pressurizing for saying, I want open silicon as well. I think we're, it's a useful discussion. 
we've got it recorded on video, it'll go on YouTube, which means people can come back in a year or two's time and say, what on earth are they talking about? I've made notes as well. And Julius has made some notes, so those okay. will get, Julius will probably, I guess, you'll put them on the wiki, so we're on record yeah. in the discussion. <laughs> I'd like to hand over now to Stefan, who's going to lead a discussion on the uh, um, tool chain uh, infrastructure. And we have, in particular, we have a proposal from, was it from Sebastian? I can't remember who it was from, that we should have a change to the ABI. Mm. Okay, Stefan, all yours. 